your days are numbered. Your kingdom brought to an end. You have been weighed in the balances, and you have failed. Your kingdom is divided. It has been given over. Your days are numbered. Your kingdom brought to an end. I think all of us take for granted uh, having a shelter, having a place to live. And, you know, when storms like the last few days happen, you know, we're just really thankful that we can be indoors. And probably very few of us have ever been outside for any extended period of time during a storm without shelter. And there was one time when uh, I took a group, we actually came all the way from Texas when I was living there to Georgia to hike on the Appalachian Trail. And we had about 12 kids with us. And during our hiking excursion, we uh, were called in this terrible, awful storm. It was lightning and thunder, and you know we had nowhere to go, literally. And and there's trees blowing, limbs falling, and you know the safety and the welfare of these kids were you know on me, and you know I felt really good about that. And and, and so it's like, what do we do? And we looked at the map, and we realized a couple miles up the road there was this shelter here, and you know it doesn't look like much at all. But during a time like we were experiencing, we just couldn't wait to get there and get inside and be protected. And so shelter is something we take for granted, but it's something that's vital when we need it. And I think as we studied in this book of Daniel, that sometimes we've realized that we've taken for granted our faith uh, in this culture that we have. And I want you to think of our Christian heritage in this country is kind of like an umbrella that we've had. We've had a protection over us as Christians, not only at protection, but actually being a Christian over the last 300 years in the United States has been advantageous to us. It's been something that we is looked on with respect and even honor. And it can be something that, that, that in our culture, if you follow the, the, the God's commands, it actually will bring you some uh, success and prosperity even. And as we see that, and talked about a great deal in this series, we see and we look around, we read the no, news, we watch the news, we see slowly but rather quickly now picking up speed that this protection is gone, that this idea of having this spiritual umbrella over us or this protective umbrella over us is is fading away. And how are we going to respond as a church, as individuals, in this new post-Christian culture that we find ourselves in? I, I read some interesting statistics that actually those who consider themselves devout Christians, meaning those who truly believe God's word, and are faithful in church and in their community of believers, that group is actually slightly increasing in our society, believe it or not, in, in spite of everything you heard. But there's a couple of other things that are taking place as well. On the other side, those who are secular, those who just maybe flat out atheist or em- embrace you know, the things that our culture teaches us, which is culture, uh, tolerance is saying, you know, you know, don't tell anybody they're wrong and that you're right. Uh, that's just the worst thing you can possibly do. And this moral relativism, uh, just, you know, everybody's equal. There's no religion above the other. And, and these are the things that, that our society holds dear. And those people on the, the extreme, the other side, they're getting more as well. And that doesn't, it comes to no surprise to you that this group is growing stronger. And they're being much more um, vocal about their criticism and even ridicule of Christians and our faith and and what we believe in. But what I was reading was the difference here in our society, what's changed, because there's always been these groups, um, what's changed is this middle area. People who in the past said either they were Christians and they attended Easter and Christmas at church, or they believed in morals and values, some Judeo-Christian principles, and, and, and they were kind of in the middle, but they leaned kind of toward, you know, being respectful for Christianity, had many of the same values and beliefs and principles that we have, even though they may not be Christian. Well, that group in the middle has changed. All right, that lukewarm middle, those people are now leaning more toward the other side, the secular side. And so culture is changing, plain and simple. That things that we used to take for granted, this protection that we used to have, it's going away. It's going away. And so what we're going to learn from Daniel is, how do we respond in situations like this? How do we respond when 
life is, uh, is against us as believers. And, and first and foremost, I think that those of us in attendance need to ask this question to ourselves. Are we devout? Do we say that we believe Scripture and then back it up by what we attempt to live in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit? Or do we kind of fall into that lukewarm middle ourselves? Because what's going to happen is there's going to be a purifying effect. As more and more pressure comes on us as Christians, those who, you know, I just go to church because it feels good, you know, or I go to church because it's a cultural thing to do, those people are going to drop by the wayside. And I would say that actually could be a good thing. In fact, Jesus would agree with that. In Revelation chapter 3, when Jesus is speaking to the church at Laodicea, and he's talking about these lukewarm people, look what he says. He says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Now, contrary to what maybe you've heard in the past, what he's not saying is it's better to be cold and indifferent than to be lukewarm. What he's saying in this passage is that cold is good, cold water is great, hot water has its values, has its uses. But he says, if you're just this lukewarm metal, and because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, no value, I'm going to spit you or spew you out of my mouth. And so Jesus says, those lukewarm middle, they really have no value for the church. And the truth is, it's probably a good thing, purifying effect that's happening in our culture. Because those who are truly, truly Jesus followers, they're going to be recognized as such because of the stands they take. Now let me do say this, all right? Maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know, I'm a newer Christian or maybe, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not as good as some other people in here that maybe live the Christian life. Lukewarm isn't talking about people who are striving through God's power to live the life and, and you fail and, and, and make mistakes and, and struggle because we all find ourselves in that situation. But there's a difference between this, this indifference. It's what can God do for me versus I'm going to live my life for God's glory. And so many people, it's if, if God can give me health, wealth, prosperity, keep my kids safe, keep our marriage intact, and it's all about using God for my benefit versus me living my life for God's glory, regardless of where that takes me. And so that's the difference between just maybe an immature believer that you may be, who you strive to, 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 you want to grow and please God, and you're doing the things, you're here in church, you're in small group on Wednesday night, K groups, those things to which will build up your faith. But if you find yourself in that lukewarm middle, I would encourage you to very li listen very carefully to the words that we talk about today, and also just really meditate in your own heart and see, where, where am I at on this? Where am I at? And so what I love about Daniel in these last four weeks and now the fifth week in Daniel, I love Daniel because he's working for a pagan king in a hostile co culture toward God. In fact, he was taken captive there. He was exiled from his home country, taken away. And this is about 600 years before Christ, to give you a little perspective. And uh, the Babylonians, they choose the best and the brightest Jewish boys. And they begin to put them in leadership training and train them up. And they're, they're, what their goal is here is to assimilate these Jewish guys, these bright Jewish young men, into the Babylonian culture, hoping they'll forget their identity, they changed their name, they were, were hoping that these guys could just, just merge into the worldview of the Babylonians and contribute to that society. And what I love about Daniel is that even though he is able to work within the system and even find success at times, he never compromises on his belief and his faith in God. He never compromises when it matters. And so Daniel strikes that perfect balance of working in a secular culture, a pagan culture, yet his primary allegiance is first and foremost to God, and that's very, very clear. And that's what's great about Daniel. And not only does he just, he didn't just clock in and go to work. Jeremiah, the prophet, tells the exiles in Babylon to work for the peace and the prosperity of Babylon. He tells them, I want you to contribute to this society, but I want you to do it in a way, here's the, the trick, because Jeremiah also prophesied that judgment was coming upon Babylon if they didn't repent, repent of their wickedness and turn to God. And so Daniel and the others, they had to serve, or they were called to serve where they lived, this new residence, with love, but not abandon their values and their belief in God and not accept the values and the worldview of this culture. And the same is true for us. In this post-Christian changing culture we're in, we're called to love and serve our communities, to love and serve our nations, our nation, 
even though we don't compromise and lose our spiritual identity, we stay strong in our commitment to God and we don't compromise. And that's not easy. It takes a great deal of wisdom to find that place. And so as we get into Daniel, I want to remind you that, and we said this over and over during these weeks, this is not normal in a Christian in a society. We've had it very good the last 300 years as a culture, Christians have, to be able to live this life with some protection and respect even. But this is the normal way that Christians live. In fact, Scripture makes it clear that those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's a given as Christians. And so America's been an anomaly. We've had a unique place in history. And so we shouldn't be surprised that it has faded away. And so let's learn from Daniel chapter 6 today as we close out this series. So let's pray and then we'll jump into Daniel chapter 6. Father God, we thank you so much for your word that we can truly build our lives upon what you say and, and, the, and the truth that you give us, God. And I pray for those here today who are just struggling to really, truly put their faith fully in you. They find themselves in that lukewarm middle and the idea of persecution or standing for their faith um, is it, it, something that terrifies them because it's really not that you aren't really that valuable to them. And God, I pray today they'll see you high and lifted up and see you in your glory and will realize that being a Christian is so much more than just being saved from hell, but it's about loving you and desiring to be holy in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Daniel chapter 6, we're going to look at verse 1 and 2, and we see that Daniel is experiencing success even in the secular culture. Look at this. It pleased Darius, the king, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. So the king sets up his administration um, to protect his interests. And if, if you're kind of joining the series late, uh, Darius, in the end of chapter 5, has become king. The Medes and the Persians have overthrown Babylon. And God used Daniel to interpret the writing on the wall. And so Daniel now has a place of prominence within this administration. And God uses the Medes and the Persians to destroy Babylon the same way that he used Babylon to destroy Jerusalem and, and bring about his punishment. So it's interesting to see the irony in that situation. But Daniel finds himself, even though the administrations have changed, he finds himself in a distinguished position again. He's an, he has some authority here. And then verse 3 now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So Daniel, again, just doing the thing that Daniel did, just being excellent in all that he did. And at this point, Daniel is probably in his 80s, and he's still pursuing excellence. He's still, just as, as opportunities come about, he asserts his influence, but never compromises in what he believes and God has blessed him in that. But even though Daniel was doing the right thing, and he was just a, just a model citizen, you'll notice in verse 4 that there were people who didn't like Daniel. The people who worked with him, they didn't like Daniel. Look at verse 4. At this, this promotion, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. So they scrutinized him. Is he cheating? Is he lying? Is he being dishonest? Let's, let's find out if he's doing anything wrong here. But they could find nothing. They could find no corrupt, corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Well, just pause there for a second. Corrupt or negligent, meaning, you know what? He wasn't coming in late for work. He was the model employee. He wasn't cutting corners. He was doing what he was supposed to do. Good lesson there. Verse 5. Finally, these men said... We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these guys are jealous. They're angry that a Jew would be placed over the whole kingdom, and they're finding fault with him, and they can find nothing wrong except maybe, hey, his faith in God. Maybe that's the only thing that we can pick out here. And, and, and a couple of other interesting things here. Even when we are doing our jobs well, we're being people of integrity. 
we're trying to uh, live and, and, and operate within the parameters that we're supposed to operate in and try to glorify God in what we do, we still won't always get along with everybody. There's going to be people who don't like us because of our faith. And this is going to become more and more true. Up until the last few years, that's not been the case. We've been here. We're not there anymore. And so people are going to give you a hard time, are going to pick at you, are going to belittle you even because of your beliefs in Jesus and your commitment to follow him with your whole heart. And look what Paul says in Romans chapter 12. He, he, he tells us that we should work for peace for, with people that we live with and work with. Look what he says. He says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. So he says, we're not trying to stir up things. We're not trying to, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure they know the problems they have in their lives. And I'm going to be that person who's constantly nagging at them about everything. So no, Paul says, live at peace with everyone if possible. But the truth is, when we live for Jesus and we stand for Jesus, it's not always going to be possible. Peace isn't going to always be available for us. But our tendency is, most of the time, to repay evil for evil as Christians. You know, we think almost we have a right to revenge, a right to get even. Back when I was in college, um, I was in, in, the, in the gymnasium one day, and this guy was in there, found out later his name was Richard Lawler, and Richard just rubbed me the wrong way by something he did. I, I don't even remember exactly what he did that bothered me, but I felt, I, I remember feeling personally disrespected by him. But instead of obeying God's command that says, don't repay evil for evil, I began to plot how to get even with Richard Lawler. And, and looking back, it, you know, I just, it, it, it just that kind of anger and bitterness, who's that destroy? It destroys ourselves. It just, if we walk around with this, you know, I'm going to get that, I'm going to make that right. I'm going to get, I'm going to get even with that person. And with Richard, I began to scheme how I could get, uh, get even with him. All right. You need a little, a little understanding of the school I went to. It was a Christian college. And at this college, we had rules that you had to follow, um, especially rules to, regarding like male and female relationships, or you know we couldn't smoke and drink and those type of things. It was a Christian college, so we had to follow uh, biblical principles in that. And so uh, we were on this demerit system. And so you could get demerit for, for things like you know skipping chapels or not being in at curfew, et cetera, et cetera. And about, I think, 75 demerits was when you got kicked out of school. If you reached that number, you were gone. All right? Well, I'm in my RA's room one night, and his little demerit pad was laying there on his desk. And so the first thing I did, I stole that demerit pad, all right? And so I took the demerit pad back to my room, and I put Richard Lawler and his girlfriend on the demerit slip and gave him like 25 demerits, which would have been like a third of what they needed to get booted out. And then I said, it was for too much physical contact. And I told him they had to come to the dean's office as soon as they received this notification. And then I took the, the demerit slip and I went into the, the, like where the post office boxes were on campus. And I opened this box, put the demerit slip in, closed the box back. And then the next day I waited and watched as he got that demerit slip, opened it up and, and read it with his girlfriend. And, you know, just became infuriated and, and shocked and, and, and couldn't believe what was going on. And I sat back and was like, yeah, that's great. I love it. And, and I was repaying evil for evil. And I know none of you would ever do anything like that, right? But that's our tendency as human beings is to repay evil for evil. I wasn't through there, all right, to make myself look even worse, all right? Um, he, he was in one of my classes with me, and he would never come to class, and he had another guy answer attendance for him. And so I let the professor in on his note saying, hey, Lawler doesn't come to class. Somebody else answers yes for him for being present. And then it busted him for that as well. So, so anyway, I, I felt really like, oh, yeah, I got revenge on this guy. And that's our tendency, isn't it? Our tendency is to try to take matters in our own hands. We want to make sure that we dish out justice. And as we approach this culture, we're, we're going to be picked on or made fun of for our belief system. It's going to be easy to get in the flesh and begin to seek revenge or try to make things, you know, like, I'm going to prove you wrong. And it becomes more about us and our agenda other than God's kingdom and his agenda. And especially for those who have that personality that like to debate and discuss, and, and you get angry when things don't go your way, 
All right? We've got to step back for a second and see, what is our mission? Is our mission to, 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 to belittle people or prove our point, or is it truly to glorify God and, and, and lift his name up? And so how do we approach these situations? Well, I think Daniel's a great example, and, and as Paul reminds us, we don't repay evil for evil. We, as far as it depends upon us, we work for peace when possible, realizing that won't always be the case. So how are you going to respond? I think we need to think about that ahead of time. How are you going to respond when people hate you, dislike you, despise you, gossip about you because of your faith, because of your beliefs, because of what you believe about Jesus, because you go to church? That may be a ways down the road in Bainbridge, Georgia, but it's coming probably faster than we hope it will. And so Daniel, he, he's living this life above reproach, and these guys start to, to critique his life, and they look for ways to, to find problems with him. How would you feel about that? How would you feel? What would happen? What would be the result of the study of people around you that you work with if they said, hey, I'm going to evaluate John's life, and we're just going to watch everything that he does, and we're going to make notes and try to find some flaw in his character and what he does. How would you honestly think about yourself for a second? Think about your work relationships. Think about that person at work that you don't like. Think about those situations you get yourself into. And then also on your private life, think about your private life. These guys were, were seeking every opportunity to find fault with Daniel. So think about your private life even. When there's moments where you're like, okay, I'm out of the public eye. Think about you know if they were watching your house, the way that you scream and yell at your wife or your husband or the way that you treat your children or the way that you, um, you know, the things that you watch and look at. Think about if, if somebody was scrutinizing those things and watching those things, what would that reveal about your life and my life? Well, they were watching Daniel like that. So what changes would you make if you knew your life was being watched that way? And the truth is, I mean, I know we say it and we think, oh, you know, God sees it. Yeah, sure, God sees it, but God does. God sees what we do in secret. God knows what happens in our households. Are we living our lives the way that God's called us to live? So Daniel's colleagues, they realized the only way to trap him was to pit his obedience to God against his obedience to his government that he worked for. Look at verse 6. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators... Prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that if anyone prays to any god or human during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So Darius, King Darius put the decree in writing. So King Darius is tricked here. I mean, he probably thought it was a good thing. Hey, this will unify the country if everybody prays, you know, just to me. And they're, they're, they're just building up his ego. They're trying to make him feel, you know, important, which, he, you know, he was in that culture. He was very important. But just pray for him, not all the other gods that they worship, but only to King Darius for these next days. And make this law where it can't be changed. And he did this not realizing the implications on his friend Daniel. And so Daniel had to choose between praying to God whom he had served his entire life, or praying to a man who could neither hear him or grant him anything. You know what? The truth is, we know from Daniel, this wasn't a difficult decision, was it? Daniel wasn't a difficult at all. For me, it would have been difficult, wouldn't it? Jeremy talked about this a few weeks ago when he talked about the fiery furnace and the guys, how they had to bow before the idol. And I think this is, is true here as well, that we could have so justified, you know, kind of taking the middle ground, the lukewarm way, you know, hey, you know, prayer is a personal thing anyway. You know, I'm just going to pray in my mind over the next 30 days, all right? Nobody has to know. Why, why sacrifice my entire life? Here I'm 80-some years old. Why sacrifice my life when I can still pray, you know? And prayer is about my personal relationship with God anyway. It's not about everybody else knowing. So, it's, so can't you see the rationale that we could have and how that we could justify just, you know, doing that? You know, I mean, truthfully, if you want to be honest, how many of us have done that just in our prayers in public before, okay? You know, maybe you know, like, you always bow your head to pray before a meal, even though the Bible doesn't say you have to, but you always do that. And you get out with guys at work, and you're having lunch, and there's a little voice in your head that says, what about the meal prayer? You always do that. Why are you not doing it now? 
Well, I, I can pray with my eyes open, right? You know, I, they don't have to see me pray or, you know, I don't want them to think I'm all high, high and mighty, you know, so I'm just going to pray or, you know, I'm going to drop that French fries and pray on the way down. Yeah, amen. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we do it. Do we not do that? Do we not? We do. We do that because we get ashamed of God. And what will people think about us? What are they going to say? You know, they're going to look at me and make judgments. But not Daniel. Daniel did what he always had done. He did what he always had done. Look at verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open toward Jerusalem. Notice that he didn't go and open the windows and say, hey, you're going to listen to this. The windows were open. Three times a day, he had been doing this consistently. He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. So this wasn't something new for Daniel. This was Daniel's routine. This is what he did always. And he did what he had always done. Because prayer wasn't just an occasional thing for Daniel where when things are going bad, he's crying out to God. Prayer was a consistent habit for Daniel. It was very intentional what he did. Because he knew that if he was going to live for God's glory in this pagan culture, and he needed the strength to stand when when it was time to stand, prayer was what he needed. If he was going to fear God more than fear what man could do against him, it had to come from prayer, and it had to come from God's strength, not his own strength. And what a great reminder for us, because the truth is we know that if we're not intentional and have a plan about prayer, it just ain't going to happen, is it? I mean, I mean, we might do the mealtime prayer. That might be a habit we're in. But we won't really truly have heartfelt, heart-driven prayer unless we're intentional about it. Just like exercise. We all know exercise is good for you. And exercise, you know, results in an improved quality of life. And, and you're going to feel better about yourself. You're going to feel better during the day. But how many of us, you know, we start out with good intentions at the beginning of the year and it fades away. Well, how much more important is prayer that we have a plan and that we execute on that plan? Daniel had a plan. He had a consistency about it. And here's some of the excuses we use. You know, we're busy. And prayer takes time, doesn't it? It takes time. We're distracted. We're just distracted people. We're all over the place. And prayer takes concentration. We like instant results. But prayer takes patience. We like loud and fast and exciting. And prayer requires us to be quiet and still. We like action. Prayer demands passive dependence upon God. Prayer is truly countercultural. Everything in our world is about speed and, 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 and fame and excitement and energy. And prayer says, go to your closet, shut the door, and the God who sees you in secret will reward you openly. And prayer's hard. It goes against everything. The, 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 the devil is working against us. The flesh is working against us. And it's countercultural to this world. But Daniel established a meaningful time of prayer. And I'm going to give you a couple real practical things that you could do to improve your prayer life that, that won't require major, major adjustments if you want to start being more consistent in your prayer and heartfelt prayer. The first one is use times that are those times that are between moments as prayer times. Like, for instance, driving. All right? When you're alone in the car, what's the tendency? I need noise. You know, I need something going on. You know, I, I'm texting, you know, when I'm driving. Put away everything that, that distracts you and use those moments maybe on your commute into work, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, and use those more moments for prayer. God, give me perspective on this day. Help me to glorify you in what I do. God, I pray you'll help me to resist those temptations that are going to come at me today. And there's time that you don't have to create new space for it. It's there already in your schedule. And other times that you can think in between times when you know that, you know what, instead of grabbing Facebook or whatever, I'm going to use a few minutes to pray because I understand how important and valuable it is. Because the truth is, most of us can have really good intentions about it, but it won't happen. Here are some times where just they're there. They're available to you. Here's, here's, a, here's another one, and I challenge particularly you dads here. Redeem the mealtime prayer, okay? Redeem the mealtime prayer. Most Christians, that's when we pray before the meals. But what does it turn into, honestly? The same rote prayers time and time again. God, we bless this food, uh, bless um, our day, give us a good day. And it's just, you know, it, we might as well not even pray the prayer because it's really just about us. And it's just a routine that we say every time. 
What if dads, what if like you sat down for dinner and you gave a heartfelt prayer? It didn't have to be like super, you know, like theological, you know, it's up here in the air, the almighty God who make us, you know, just something that's from the heart, something that's true. And I know that'd be hard because you know that your kids would be like looking up at you like, what's going on here, right? And, and so that puts a lot of pressure on you. You know that you're, you know, you're going to be looked at in a different light. And it's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to take that step like that and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out and do some, take some spiritual leadership in my home in a very small way, just being real in a prayer. I mean, that shouldn't be a huge deal, but it is because Satan's working against you and he's saying, you're going to look really stupid, all right? You don't know what to say. Your prayers aren't near as good as Pastor John's. And, and, and Satan's going to whisper all these excuses into your mind. But think what would happen in your family if you begin to lead in that kind of way. When you, if you begin to take those moments to say, I'm just going to pray real prayers here. There's times that you're already praying, most of you. But let's make them sincere and real, not just rote and the same thing over and over again. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel prays a prayer and... and uh, Obviously, you know, we're not saying that your prayer at mealtime has to be of this caliber. But you know what? If it's from the heart, it doesn't matter the words you say as long as they're sincere and real before God and based on truth, the spirit and truth. Look what Daniel's prayer. I think it's just a great, great example. He says, verse 4, Lord, the great and awesome God. So right away, he doesn't make it about him. He acknowledges God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commands. And then he confesses, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and your laws. And I won't take the time to go through the entire prayer. Maybe later on read that on your own. But at the end, he says, you know what? The, the, the worst thing about the things we're doing is, God, I'm afraid people are going to look at you, look at us, and then look down on you, God. And my most important thing is to bring glory to your name. And I feel like your name has been brought down by your people. And so this is just a God-centered, God-saturated prayer where he says, you know what, it's not about just my request, it's about you, God, first and foremost. And so I think there's a lot we can learn there. And so Daniel, he just does his prayer. He's Mr. Consistent. He's, he, he's just a man of integrity. And this is the only thing they can find a problem with him. Verse 11, then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. They find him there in his room asking God for help. And so he's discovered, and then they run back and report it to Darius the king. And Darius responds, he's distressed. He's troubled because he knew he had been tricked. But because of the rule of law, he's unable to change the law. And it requires anyone who violates us to be thrown into the lion's den. And so reluctantly, verse 16, uh, Darius orders the punishment. And uh, his parting words to Daniel, look at verse 16. May your God, whom you serve continuously rescue you. Isn't that interesting? Darius rescue, uh, recognizes Daniel just con- serves God continuously. He's continuously serving God. And then verse 17, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. So he was stuck in there. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. Wouldn't it be great to have a split screen here just seeing what was going on? So you got the king, the powerful ruler of the world, and he's in his room, and he can't sleep. He's pacing around. He's in distress. He's, he's worried. And Daniel, on the other hand, he's in here with these lions. And what's he doing? He's, he's either praying or he's sound asleep, you know? And it's easy for us to breeze through this part about being in the lion's den, you know, and, and we see pictures like that, and we don't really get the significance of like what it would be like to be in the presence of all these lions and literally just rest knowing that God has sent his angel to protect you, you know? I, I, you, most of you know I'm not a cat lover, okay, and we, but we have some cats, and when they hiss at me and, and do this, I'm like, whoa, go, and I scoot back, I get a little nervous just from that. Think about one of these big, gigantic lions, all right? And, and they're walking around you, they're pacing around you, they're rubbing up against you, and Daniel stands there, and he's praying, and he's at peace before God. I mean, that's a supernatural miracle. And, and, and it truly happened. We don't look over and say, yeah, 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 sure, it's a story. I've heard that many years, you know, when I was in Sunday school. This really happened. It's true that God delivered him from the lion, even as King Darius is falling apart in his room and can't sleep. 
And so what happens? Verse 19, at the first light of dawn, the anxious king, he runs down to the lion's den and he cries out, has your God, whom you serve continuously, been able to rescue you from the lions? And of course, we know that God did. He rescued Daniel. And as a result, skip down a few verses, calls it time. Uh, Darius pens another letter. This is the second time in Daniel's uh, life here that because of his faithfulness to God, a letter has been sent to the entire empire declaring the praises of God. So God has received glory and honor throughout the kingdom because of the faithfulness of his, of his servants. Look at verse 26, what this letter says. It says, Darius says, I issue a decree that in every part of the kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 28, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So everywhere Daniel goes, God gets glory. Daniel just had the Spirit of God on him. And he was able, no matter who he was around, he brought glory to God, even in adversity. That was his primary desire. That's what he was about. And shouldn't the same thing be said of us? What if our co-workers, if they really scrutinized our life, said, you know what? Their life glorifies God. Their life honors God. You know, I, I just, they're not perfect, but I don't find really any fault in them. But you know what? Just like Daniel, there's going to be people that even though you live your life controlled by the Spirit, living out the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness around people, there's still going to be people who are not going to like you because of your faith. Why? Well, you don't need to take it personally because here's why. They rejected and killed Jesus, who you follow. And so they're going to reject us. Ultimately, you know what? People don't like God. Romans 1 talks about that people reject God because they don't want to be told what to do. I don't want you putting me, God, in this, in this box. I don't want parameters around my life. I'm going to live life whatever feels good or makes sense to me or seems to make me happy at the moment. And so they don't want God and they try to ignore God and write God away and, and act like God doesn't exist. And when they see, get this. When they see you and me living like God, it reminds them of God. And that's why they reject you, because they're ultimately rejecting God. And so we realize as Christians, we carry the name of Jesus wherever we go. And when we're rejected because of that, they're rejecting God first and foremost. What the greatest compliment in the world to be rejected for the name of Christ, because they're rejecting God, not us. What a, what, what a great, incredible thing. We need to step out of this lukewarm metal, don't we? It's been a good run here in America. And God can turn it around if he wants to turn it around. But the truth is, biblical Christianity probably will prosper more when we're not the dominant culture, when we're not sitting here and we're under the umbrella and we're saying, you know what? It's good to be a Christian because it's, it's easy. It, it's simple. It's good. It's good for business. But when this is removed and all of a sudden, persecution, rejection. Actually, to use the word persecuted is probably not the right word because the truth is it, it should be the normal thing to be treated that way because of Jesus. That's the way it's been through history. So to call rejection, persecution probably is not, not the right thing to call it. It's just, that's just normal Christianity. And so what about you? Are you content with just playing church, doing the church thing, or is Jesus really your Lord and Savior? Are you willing to stand for him regardless of the cost? My fear is too many people in the United States, they, like 2 Timothy 3.3 says, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. You know what Paul says? Have nothing to do with these people. Don't have anything to do with them because the truth is that when you have people who come into the church and it's just pretend, it's fake, it's playing the game, they actually bring scorn and shame upon the name of God. And people look at the church and they, you know. So what about us? Are we willing to stand for our faith? Do we really know Jesus? Is our faith really in him? And those of us who would put ourselves into the devout category, we really love Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. 
Have we gotten too used to the dominance? Are we willing to be disrespected for the name of Christ? Are we willing to be foolish even for the name of Christ? You know, we like to be professional. We like to look, be looked at as, in our, in our society, as like we're respected. Oh, there's somebody important. But what happens when you have to balance out between, you know what, maybe I can't be important and respected and be a Jesus follower at the same time. What Something's got to give here. Am I willing to give my reputation up and my status up for the sake of the gospel? It's going to cost something to be a Christian. It's going to make us lean more upon Jesus. It's going to make the distinction between dark and light very, very clear on it. So three things I want us to take from today in this series. One is, if you were being watched like Daniel, what changes would you make? What changes would you make if you were being watched? And the second thing, which our power for number one comes from, what's one specific thing you can do to make the discipline of prayer more important in your life. Because the truth is, in this day and age we live in, we will not survive. We will not live in, with integrity. We will not bring glory to God unless we're connected to his power, not our own. And then the third, what wisdom have you gained from Daniel which will allow you to better glorify God in a post-Christian culture? What wisdom have you gained? Because, you know, the truth is, we can, we can look at the life of Daniel and say, oh, it's great, good stuff, good stuff. But we walk out and we were like, okay, what's next? Okay, where are we going next? What's, what's going on next? And we live our life for those mountaintop moments or those next new things or those exciting things. And the truth is, life following Jesus is lived out in the day-to-day little decisions, thousands of little decisions we make every day. Whether we're going to follow our own selfish desires or if we're going to follow Jesus. If we're going to die to ourselves and love others, or if we're going to continue to love our lives and seek to, to, to make our lives what life is about. So what? Honestly, what, what, what are we going to do as a result of this? Dads, mealtime prayers, in between moments on prayers, areas of our life where we know we need to confess sin because we know we have areas in our life where we're just, we've not been honest with ourselves or with others. And then wisdom. What wisdom can we glean from Daniel and his life to help us as we face a culture where we don't have this to protect us anymore and we have to lean totally and wholly upon Jesus for his protection, his comfort and guidance in our lives. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the life of Daniel. We thank you for your your word, God, that just gives us life and gives us truth. And God, I pray you'll help us to, to just lean more and more into your word every day and to, to, to go to you for our strength and for our hope. God, I pray that you will help us as a nation. God, if you see it in your sovereignty, to turn our nation back to where we do respect you and honor you and lift you up as, as a country. God, we ask for that. But regardless of what you choose to do, because we know you put kings in place and you remove kings, that it's all about you, God, and what you desire. God, regardless of what happens, Help us to be authentic and real and genuine followers of you, regardless of how much pressure or what kind of persecution we fall under, God. Help us to realize that it's, it's all about you. It's all about you in every, everything that we do. We pray in Jesus' name.